Gran Turismo is a name that has been sticking around for decades. Since the primordial times of 32-bit consoles back in the 90s, it has shaped what we want from a racing game, and its evolution has also shaped how we view racing games. Gran Turismo 7, much like sport, has not been consensual and it seems to have a massive change in tone. I'll be approaching this title both from a Gran Turismo fan of almost two decades and also from a sim racing perspective as well. Gran Turismo 7 now is not the same Gran Turismo from launch, so in some points the opinions are from 1.31 update onwards, but to be fair, this is mostly true of all racing titles with large gaps between title launches. Sport is included in this, which in many ways has paved the road to Gran Turismo 7. GT7 though in one year has evolved more than most racing titles do in the time between launches. Part of this are small improvements over every month, part of that is that Gran Turismo 7 at launch was severely lacking. I won't be touching every single subject of this game, but I'll be as thorough as possible. At first glance, the game menu is a throwback to Gran Turismo's of yore, all the main options will be visible from the get-go, being locked behind completing missions, so to open up online it can take a couple of hours until those checkboxes are complete. As a series, Gran Turismo has always been eclectic. The history and stories of racing have always been front and center, all through the lenses and tastes of Kazunori Zamayushi had for the time. 1 through 4 were really centered around car culture with plenty of homages to real racing. 5 and 6 mirrors Kaz's racing career and brought figures like Ayrton Senek or even historic cars like the Moonlander. 7, it seems to me to have followed a change in tastes of a more mature Kazunori that is very visible at a cafe and this cafe visually shows itself as a very upmarket experience, something for the car connoisseur. That is further presented by something that I consider one of the big shifts not only in tone but also in terms of game structure, the menu books. In previous games, sports included, there was a strict way of progressing. You unlock licenses and that would unlock races, championships, special events or parts of the game. This time, the menu books are front and center as the way of progression. The tonal change becomes apparent as every single time a menu is unlocked or finished. A story about a brand or a car comes out like they are describing the growing season of a wine grape. It can be interesting, and I'm saying it can be interesting because while the stories behind Porsche or Ford GT can be interesting from a car enthusiast perspective, I'm really not too sold on the value of these menus for cars like the Prius. As a way of progression, these menus get old really fast, and while pursuing the menu races, it's also possible to see something else that becomes really old really fast. The game menu that is a throwback to other Gran Turismo's becomes its worst enemy. Every single time something needs to be changed or a menu moved, car bought, an upgrade and so on, there's an option to be chosen. So let's say if you want to buy some wheels for your car, you'll need to go to the shop. Then choose the particular option for the car upgrades until you get to the desired area. So every single time an option is chosen, there is a load time. Load times that become especially annoying if you are in a PlayStation 4. Applying changes even on a PlayStation 5 takes a lot of time and going to another option even on the same menu takes also a lot of time. So if there are multiple things that need to be done, all of these wait times get old really soon. In the PlayStation 5 that is not so bad in overall, but the menu structures are clearly outdated and if you have a PlayStation 4 you're gonna cry a bit. Because the menu books as they are structured require us to jump from area of the globe or the menu, those load times will make this a tedious experience. If you compare it to previous Gran Turismo's like Sport 5 or 6, this seems like a step back. What is not a step back is the driving experience and that includes not only the driving itself which we'll talk a little bit later but also cars and track selection. There is a significant array of cars ranging from the mundane to the legendary. For 7, Polyphony Digital decided to bring back some of the elements of previous Gran Turismo and expand on these ideas. Now we have a dealership that is used for new cars, a used car dealership where you can get older cars and now sell the cars that you have extra, and then a legendary car dealership for rarer vintages. 
cars like the E-Type, Suzuki Scudo and so on would be here. Because of these choices, the price of cars can vary widely from just a few thousand of credits to millions. It's here where we can see maybe one of the most controversial things about Gran Turismo 7, in this case, buying the cars via microtransactions. At the launch, it was very hard to collect credits, so you could say that it could be something contentious. Right now, not really so much as the economy has improved vastly and collecting credits isn't really that difficult, so all of this makes the microtransactions irrelevant. We also need to be fair, Gran Turismo 7 is really not the first Gran Turismo with microtransactions anyways. The car selection is wide, but sometimes incomplete. We have many types of cars like JDM Heroes, like a Supra, new launched cars like the new Supra. And with the legendary dealership, we have cars like the GT500 Supra and a McLaren F1. There's really a bit for everybody. However, some of these car choices are weird as they come from Gran Turismo 5. You have cars like the Magana RS or Polo GTI and those haven't really been updated for the newest generation. So they are like two or three generations old right now. Others are under trimmed like the RCZ or Mito. These two cases are basically choices where they are just average or entry level trims when the far more interesting top of the line cars like the RCZ are or the Quadrifoglio Verde were available even at the time when those two cars were modeled into Gran Turismo 5 and 6. All cars have some degree of customization, colors, wheels, liveries, body parts, some cars even wide bodies, but don't expect anything like the degree of Forza. Car performance improvements always have been a part of Gran Turismo since the beginning, but I'm inclined to say that this time the tone also changed to collecting more performing cars rather than picking up a lower-end Miata and go through it as much as possible. Still, the engines can be swapped, and even sometimes through the roulette system, uh, rare engine mods can be picked up, and you can even put the rotary into a Miata if you are into that. And why wouldn't you? The tracks are also in the important part of the content list. There is an impressive selection of real tracks and original tracks from previous Gran Turismos. The real tracks are done to a level of perfection that puts a lot of other racing games to shame, maybe bar Assetto Corsa Competizione. The detail is absolutely phenomenal in the real life tracks, you get the elevations, the tree coverage, moving spectators and even background traffic. All of this gives a sense of immersion that the track is alive. Sadly, some of the previous real life tracks from 5 and 6 are not present like Silverstone, Cote d'Azur or Monaco or Indianapolis. This level of attention or detail also transfers to the fantasy original tracks. There are next-gen tracks that came from Sport, these received mild updates for 7. The revamped older tracks like Trial Mountain or the newly added Grand Valley are extremely different from their predecessors. The layouts change at various levels, High Speed Ring just gets a small update, but in the case of Grand Valley, even the scenery has changed. And speaking of scenery, some of these tracks, while stunning, and the scenery seems a bit ethereal with vast views in an unspoiled scenery, like the tracks weren't supposed to be there or those areas don't exist anywhere on Earth. Still, the fantasy roster misses some of the most popular tracks of the past, like Apricot Hill, Chamonix, R246 or Midfield. Maybe they will appear in the future. Graphically, and because of all that we've seen in cars and tracks, I think this is the best looking racing game ever developed. The cars, the models, the tracks are absolutely stunning. But this is further helped by Polyphony's digital vision of what should constitute light. Photorealism isn't just about the assets, the assets help a lot of course, but it's also how the light perform in multiple circumstances. I'm yet to see a title to do it this well and at such a great frame rate. Even PlayStation 4 hardware is capable of realizing extremely convincing graphics, of course at a lower level of detail. The addition of ray tracing helps to create a really convincing light system as well. Activating it doesn't work in actual gameplay, but it rather works in replays or when taking photos. Let's talk about the driving, and after all this is a racing game, what I'm going to say is probably gonna irk a lot of people, but I really don't care. I think Gran Turismo 7 provides a believable driving mechanics, but before going there, we need to understand what is Gran Turismo and what is the objective of a Gran Turismo game. 
GT is a gateway into racing. It's sort of an open church to all. It will be very likely the first contact many have with racing and caters to many types of people using a lot of different peripherals. From controllers to now direct drive wheels on consoles. It's really hard to balance all of these factors and still create a title that is approachable but still relevant and close enough to be relatable to the real thing to the point you can transfer the skills that you learn in Gran Turismo in other games. The handling of 7 is convincing enough. The cars handle how they are supposed to handle as in power, acceleration, general handling derived from a car layout. So a car with a front engine rear wheel drive will act like one. So will a midship. The handling can be really convincing, especially on production cars using lower end tires. I I'm really surprised when driving cars like the RX-7, the GT86 or even the Golf GT High and, and they are convincing in the way they moved, how the suspension works, you know, the braking distances and so on. There is a lot of simulation value here that sometimes is not recognized, but we have to be fair, the higher the output and close to the racing specs the game goes, the bigger the simplification is made on a physics engine, and this is apparent. They still relate to the layouts and such, but it really does seem to have it far more simplified, so it gives a fair shake to both controller users and wheel users alike. Still, there are a couple of tire compounds that are really weird. For example, the sports hards makes everything skittish, and race hards make everything with understeer. Still, it is really not easy to have a title replicate a road car like a Golf GTI, and then at the same breath replicate a GT3 car. I think the driving now after the updates is really commendable. The rain driving is really well developed. First of all, when there's weather activated, this weather will be dynamic. The track develops naturally as the rain comes in or out. The puddles will stay the longest and the areas where cars pass through, they will dry the fastest. That has a profound effect on the driving as the areas with more water are naturally more slippery and the graphical fidelity of rain is absolutely phenomenal. Having said all of this, Gran Turismo 7 is not an arcade game. Arcade driving doesn't work here because those tires, the tires that are developed into the GT7, do not allow for high-speed maneuvers of this kind. But it's also really not a focused simulation title, as the handling, the tire simulation is simplified. It is really hard to balance the openness of a platform and fidelity. As it stands right now in terms of simulation and fidelity, I think it's in really in a sweet spot for what the game is, what is supposed to be and the amount of people they want to come into the game. Let's talk about some of the most important parts of Gran Turismo, which are the single player races and basically they are the same old Gran Turismo. You basically start at the back of the race and then you have to go to the front. The AI isn't difficult at all, I'm not too sure it's because the AI is worse compared or less difficult compared to other titles or I'm becoming better at this, but it really it doesn't react, it doesn't really do anything. A couple of months ago, there was a time-limited GT Sophie event with proper AI. I missed that, I really wanted to try it out, but hopefully it comes back with more events as Gran Turismo 7 clearly needs a good AI integrated into it. There are only a couple of things that I think save the current state of single-player racing. First of all, some of the cars are driven or named by some of the GT World Series drivers, people like Fraga, Hizal, Coque Lopez. In some of the races they will have their custom car, so if you race a Japanese car or there's a Japanese car racing, it's interesting to see his all driving Subarus as he is a massive fan of that brand, so he's constantly posting images of them on his Twitter. This is a fourth wall break that I enjoy. The other point is that sometimes we can see non-named tune hero cars. While most of the AI would be pushovers, these hero cars are faster than normal and we can see them sometimes swerving around traffic or even catching up massively. Other than that, at this point, there's really nothing different from the other Gran Turismos. The menu book system has changed the amount of events and races quite significantly. So, allied with the lessons from Gran Turismo Sport, I'd say the brunt of Gran Turismo 7 is now in many levels in multiplayer. There are regular lobbies where it's possible to race against others, create your own session, do a time trial if you want to. It's more of a social racing aspect of multiplayer. But the competitive part is sport. Loading it up is really annoying as you have to hear the word sportsmanship so many times. 
But anyways, Sport comes as it was from its namesake or Gran Turismo Sport. It's basically the hub for competitive racing. It has daily racing with three different races happening at least three times an hour. There's the access to the world championships and now something new, the time trials. I find time trials competitive aspect really interesting. Every so often it rotates with the new car and track and the objective is to get within 3% of the fastest time. The objective of the sport races is to tier every driver against each other on a quasi on demand system for races that can be joined almost immediately. What it does, it rates every single individual driver based on performance and safety. Both ratings go from the worst which is D to the best that is S and then it will pair each driver with a split that matches their rating. As for the racing, there are admittedly many ups and downs. Drivers can be more often than not aggressive in committing into extreme maneuvers like hairpins with three or four wides. And of course, because of this, crashes happen. As of this moment, penalties are in a very bad state. It's really not uncommon to have certain drivers abuse the penalty system to commit road murder, get away with it, and then having the victim slapped with a five second penalty. Regardless, it's mostly due to safety rating, and I say mostly because there are a few drivers that know how to exploit this, and these issues reduce substantially in S rating safety rating. In a good split, there will be good racing but the penalties really need to improve. Gran Turismo 7 is a bit bittersweet for me. As an older Gran Turismo driver, I can see the change in tonality and makes me think this is riding on the wall as Kaz becomes older and his interests shift. In some ways, I like this title more than any other before it, but in others, I find Gran Turismo 7 lacking. The lack of races, special events, or even the goofy stuff are things I miss. Still, it is undeniable that Gran Turismo 7 knows what it's trying to portray, and it's here because of our love of cars, the stories of cars, and the engineering. It dares to have a soul, and I really love this game for it. A big thank you to all the members of the channel, as you make all of this a possibility. Also, I need to add something, content will be different for a couple of weeks, as my main PC had a massive malfunction, so streams won't come for a couple of weeks or so. If you want to support what I do, the best way to support the channel is to press like and to subscribe.